the struggle for feminism, the struggle for gender equality, the struggle for trans rights has to necessarily be an anti-capitalist struggle. Right. It cannot just be equality within the system of capital. Communal kitchens actually exist, uh, but they are they only exist for the rich and they're called restaurants, okay? Bolsheviks uh, talked about, like Kolontai, that actually the kitchen has to be abolished. Hello and welcome to another episode of India and Global Left. Today we have with us a very special guest, Professor Titi Bhattacharya. We are discussing feminism for the 99% a manifesto co-authored by Titi Bhattacharya with Cynthia Aruza and Nancy Fraser. Professor Bhattacharya is Associate Professor and Director of Global Studies at Purdue University. She was one of the main organizers of the international women's strike in the United States and is on the editorial board of the International Socialist Review. Professor Bhattacharya, welcome to India and Global Left. Thank you, Jatishman. It's very good to be here. All right. So um, our main agenda is to discuss uh, feminism for the 99%. But before that, if we could just ask you uh, a little bit about your background, the kind of intellectual um, background in which you grew up, influences of socialism, Marxism, and feminism on you, that would be great. Okay, well, I come from a family uh, which is heavily steeped in Marxism. So I'm third generation atheist and communist. Um, but I myself um, grew up in Bengal. And as you know, um, the official left uh, ruled Bengal for several decades, the CPM, but there was an, a history of sort of an unofficial uh, left, which was considered more radical, uh, the, uh, which arose out of the Naxalite movement of the late 60s and 70s. So for me personally, uh, the father's side of my family was heavily CPM, and my mom's side was heavily Naxalite. So mm -hmm. I had a very interesting um, family uh, history of uh, looking at the left from sort of uh, both kind of perspectives and trying both to understand. Revolutionary and democratic sort of state arrangements. Sure. Um, it, yes. Um, but also kind of trying to understand the roots of communist activism in the country as a whole sort of you know how how did what are the uh what is the relate what was the relationship between the indian cp and uh the soviet union um in the 1920s which is kind of a historical background if you like to some of the splits that happened in in the later period of the CP's uh, history. Uh, when I came to do my PhD in London in the 90s, I um, got involved in an occupation of my uh, university, which was the School of Oriental and African Studies, SOAS. And in that occupation, I met the re revolutionary socialist Trotsky's tendency and since then, um, you know, I call myself a revolutionary socialist and Trotskyist. But um, I think I started being dissatisfied with which, with the ways in which um, the question of feminism, feminist activism, uh, the place of gender and sexuality in capitalism had been written about in traditional Marxist uh, writing. I say traditional Marxist, I don't mean Marx, um, but, you know, sort of later writings um, and heavily sort of uh, 
Stalinized writings about um, women and gender, I began to be dissatisfied with that and hence started sort of exploring questions of um, gender and capitalism and going back to Marx and sort of going back and reading Marx all over again. And so that's a sort of um, eclectic journey towards what I would call very, very orthodox Marxism. Because when when we say orthodox Marxism, we kind of think about, you know, Stalin or some really um, economic hide, determinism, right, and hidebound ideas, right. But to me, orthodox Marxism is actually going back to Marx and looking at capital. And uh, in recent times, I've been rereading the Grundrisse and the the creativity, the open endedness the um the joy in in uh, marx's writing is is uh spectacular and i think that's what i understand to be orthodox marxism and i see myself in that sort of intellectual journey to be more embedded in that tradition we'll discuss some of that surely we'll discuss social reproduction theory um, and a little bit about its relationship with uh, classical Marxism. But uh, I wanted to begin with um, corporate feminism. I mean, your the whole manifesto is a dialogue with at least three uh, different schools of politics. One is corporate feminism. One is what you call neo-traditionalism, the right of far right, I mean, rise of the far right, which sort of tries to impose newer forms of patriarchy and sexism, and then a conversation with uh, the classical understanding of Marxism based on um, the productive sphere and not necessarily including the reproductive sphere or the social reproductive sphere. So let's begin by um, let, let's begin by discussing corporate feminism because this is feminism for the 99%. That means that there is a feminism of the one percent with which you don't agree with, and in the thesis you write it's bankrupt, or I mean, I mean, I'm paraphrasing, but you're very critical of that. Discuss that, right? So, um, as you know, um, the the book was uh, written um, in the wake of the feminist strikes, right? Which, in a way, was the sort of um, concretization of the politics that um, uh, is the politics of uh, feminism for the 99%. The strikes themselves were the embodiment of that politics. And um, I think what um, we meant by it was till throughout the 1990s, um, you know, Clinton, on this side of the Atlantic and uh, Blair on the other side of the Atlantic, um, they projected a kind of liberalism, which was open to questions of gender and race, unlike, you know, sort of, let's say the Reaganite and Thatcherite um, forms, which were uh, really resistant to questions of um, race and gender. This new dispensation was open to questions of race and gender. However, race and gender uh, diversity, if only bound strictly by class, right? So um, in other words, it could um, envision a world in which you would have a woman CEO uh, and a woman vice president of the United States, but the, uh, the, the question of um, high wages for the working class or childcare facilities for everyone were an absolute no-no. So things that were um, questions of gender that were related to the question of general upliftment of the working class were not admitted into this uh, kind of feminism. Uh, I'll give you a very concrete example. 
um, the, the CEO of Yahoo at the time um, had, she was a woman and she, um, you know, said um, very uh, proudly at the time that she was going back to work almost immediately after giving birth to her child. And um, I was very uh, interested to read that news. So I went and looked it up and it turns out that yes, she did go back to work, but what she had done is she had constructed a nursery specifically only for her child at the Yahoo yeah. headquarters so that while she worked, her child could be right next to her being cared for by trained professionals, right? That very week, she passed a regulation that no Yahoo workers could, any, uh, could uh, work from home anymore, right? So in other words, for the workers at Yahoo, all the women who had children, presumably, they could no longer work remotely. However, the CEO had the right to this extraordinary uh, feminist and gendered workplace, right? So, so that to me is sort of an example of what feminism for the 1% meant. Um, let us turn to Another example, so for instance, feminism for um, the 1% the feminists um, argue for equal wages for men and women. And, you know, as a revolutionary feminist, I am with them on that. But for me, I need to push that a step further. I need to say, what is the point of equality of wages when both those wages are extremely low. So instead, I think what we want to push for is a living wage, a wage that affords dignity for both men and women, right? So that's kind of um, the, I think the distinction between a feminism for the 99% and a feminism for the 1%, that it talks about equality in this very surface way without disturbing any of the class inequalities that are embedded in capitalist society. So equality at the top only. So this is the sort of um, substantive difference between um, the, the two kinds of feminism we outline. And I think our examples that we give are um, has become even more blatant uh, since the writing of the book. So for instance, feminists of the 1% rejoice that Kamala Harris is now the vice president of the United States. She's a woman of color and you know in the highest office, whereas feminists of the 99% are horrified that a prosecutor from California who built her career um, it, on the backs of incarceration of black men could actually be celebrated as a feminist. So if your feminism is not abolitionist, is not against carceration, then that is a feminist that is ultimately a bankrupt um, ideology or a movement in um, in the world that capitalism uh, makes us inhabit. Right. I mean, I was recently uh, uh, I happened to chance on uh, White House's press secretary uh, talking about how diverse the White House team is. You know, people of color, uh, people of dif with different gender and sexualities, and so on. And I think that. Um, I mean, one can take away uh, the gains of this, but it's like making the ruling class more diverse as, you know, working people are become, uh, are finding it in increasingly harder to sustain themselves. One of the paradoxes, especially if we look at uh, societies in the West, is that some sort of equality between sexes have happened over the last five, six decades, 
primarily because of struggles from below, but that hasn't come with increasing social equality in terms of economic equality. I mean, many believed, I mean, I was raised with this idea that if if there is greater and greater parity between men and women, there has, to, I mean, inevitably there would be more parity between different social classes, but that hasn't happened. I mean, that's something um, uh, almost like a paradox. Um, I think this is a good segue into uh, social reproduction theory, um, but I, I just wanted to sort of um, discuss very briefly uh, about how, I mean, it's it's very evident, there is not much to discuss, but the rise of the far right and how that has become a new threat. I mean, if you are following the news, um, uh, striking uh, from the African-American AP curriculum, radical scholars, uh, you know, some from the intersectionalist uh, brand, but some radical uh, scholars on gender, race, uh, in the United States, uh, in Scotland, the progressive bill that Nicola Sturgeon pushed forward was uh, vetoed by the British Parliament. So, uh, and we are seeing these trends in across Eastern Europe, India, and so on. So, there has been this um, huge overt assault to the far right on uh, you know all forms of gender assertion. So how does how does one speak to um, or how does how does we we discuss about feminism for the ninety nine percent not allowing that to you know to to become a weapon against the right wing because that's something I I am a little bit uncomfortable about I mean uh, how do we deal with that? Um, explain to me how feminism of the 99% can be a weapon for the right wing. I didn't quite uh, not, Yeah, I mean, uh, not the not what you are suggesting, and that's the power of your book, and that's what I want you to explain, but there is um, a tendency among sections of the left who are dismissing any forms of, you know, um, L queer communities uh, struggle, assertion for them, you know, gender pronouns, everything is very, very superficial because there is no material into it. And that in a way very neatly merged with the kind of Jordan Peterson's of the world. So mm -hmm. that's something I uh, worry about. And that's something I don't think is helpful for you know, uh, a feminist revolution for the 99% uh, in general. So if you could just, be, because you're, the manifesto does a tremendously good job of critiquing, you know, the feminism of 1%, but not allowing that critique to degenerate into an attack against, you know, racial struggles and so on. In fact, it's the opposite. So if you can just briefly uh, talk about that. So first of all, um... I mean, there's two things I want to um, acknowledge before we start. Mm. One is um, the uh, two days ago, a 16 year old trans um, person, a young girl, young woman was murdered in Britain. Right. Okay, uh, Brianna Gay. And there are two kinds of responses to that. You're right a section of liberals and even left in Britain um, have um, are very skeptical about um, gender pronouns and they call themselves the gender critical um, left, whatever that means. Um, and they have been very silent since this murder. Mm -hmm. But I will say this, I just looked at a map this morning of the um of the united kingdom you know uh, all of the map was dotted with um where the various vigils were taking place for this young person okay so of course um as a um, feminist as a mama as you know as another person inhabiting the planet i cannot begin to imagine what this young person's parents and loved ones are going through right now. But for us, I think 
sympathy and solidarity is not enough. We also have to root ourselves in the analysis in the sense that this murder may not have been caused by um, you know, Nazis or overt right-wing um, people. In fact, it turns out that the murder, uh, the suspects are teenagers themselves. But that to me is actually better proof of the damage that right-wing ideologies have been able to do, which mm -hmm. is to convince ordinary people that the, that trans folks are a danger to our traditional way of life, to convince ordinary people that immigrants are here to come and take our jobs, to convince ordinary people that black people are criminals, right? So if an overt Nazi who are still thankfully a minority in society commit these murders, that becomes a sort of something that we can expect from a Nazi. But when these sort of things happen, which is um, ordinary uh, people, uh, often from working class backgrounds, commit these sort of atrocities, then we should understand that these kind of right-wing ideologies may have uh, numerically uh, less strength but they have a heft that goes beyond their, at the moment, small numbers. Their ideology has a heft to it, right? Has has some power to it. And so I think, so that being said, um, we have to then sort of interrogate what empowered this sort of right-wing pop, rise of right-wing populism, mm -hmm. right? What is the ground from which it arose. And one of the things I think we have to be very clear on is that it arose from neoliberalism and the neoliberal world that the Clintons, the Blairs built, ultimately gave rise to the Trumps, the Bolsonaros and the Modis, right? And because if you look at their rhetoric, and this is very much related to what we just discussed about um, the one percent feminism is it was easy for Trump to say that uh, you know women and minorities are coming and taking your jobs because the neoliberalism had basically devastated um, working class households across the planet, right? So there mm -hmm. were actually loss of jobs and so on, and it also meant that the only way feminism was presented to the world was the feminism of Hillary Clinton. It was mm -hmm. as if, you know, working class people were not trans. The trans people were only, you know, seen on, you know, glossy magazines. Like I see this all the time in India, you know, um, you go into a, a store and it's very high end and it talks about, you know, the organic products, it talks about how it, you know, um, how it is um, respectful and attendant to the labor of the artisans. It has little stories of where this was sourced from, but the product itself will be completely beyond the reach of these mm -hmm. artisan families whose, you know, stories are being marketed here, right? So, so uh, that kind of, um, it also goes, so that kind of multiculturalism, that kind of social justice as it is packaged by capitalism made a section of the working class feel, and in, in America that would be the white working class in many ways, let them be open to this kind of vicious propaganda by people like Trump, that the bi-coastal elite have taken your jobs, you know, and all they're doing is attacking your family, attacking your values, and, and so on. So the, the ground for it was created, not because the working, white working class is racist, but because all of the working class in, in America and Britain had been robbed of their sustenance to 
make a dignified life for themselves. So into that barren land came the seeds of Trumpist propaganda, which allowed these sort of poison trees to flourish. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's, I think, the strength of the manifesto that taking capital as the base, we can critique um, the feminism of the 1% as much as we can critique or, you know, attack the radical right who wants to reconstitute a neo-traditional um, order to domesticate women and so on. Um, so let's uh, come to uh, the core of the project, um, capitalism itself. And uh, related to that, since we are thinking of feminism and capitalism, is the concept of social reproduction theory. So if we can just begin with the, you know, the idea in general and how that allows us to look at a much more expansive view of class and capitalism. And from there, we can think about a class struggle, which is not limited to um, the, 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 the skilled or high paid wage wo workers in the global north, but constitutive of the low end workers, both in the global north and the global south in general. So if we think about the um, how the virus, the coronavirus uh, pandemic uh, played out in our capitalist world, right? So as the pandemic raged through the planet, devastating lives and livelihoods, capitalist governments worldwide um, had to make an important shift, I would say, in their governing strategies. So we saw overnight nurses and janitors, agricultural workers, supermarket stockers, uh, somehow temporarily, but importantly, assume greater importance than the stockbroker and the banker, right? So- The essential uh, workers. What was that? And they were categorized as essential workers, right? And on that essential workers list, you could not find a banker or a stockbroker, right? Yes. So the work of producing commodities for profit suddenly took a back seat uh, while reproductive labor, the work that reproduces our capacity to labor and ultimately life itself, had to be put center stage by by capitalist governments, right? And I, I want to emphasize it was a very temporary shift and, you know, oh. life went back to normal. But in that those few moments, you I think that shift in governing policies made legible the real work that sustains society and all the nonsense work that capitalism values, right? So- David the, Graeber says it bullshit jobs. Exactly, exactly. So social reproduction feminism uh, is the name given to that set of conceptualizations from different strands of Marxist and socialist feminism trying to explain these processes of life making and how such processes are part, not separate from, but part of capitalist accumulation and what this means for how we as individuals and as a society produce and maintain our lives and human capacities. So social reproduction feminism is a loose, but nonetheless broadly coherent school of thought um, one that identified and developed the insight that the social labors involved in producing this and the next generation of workers plays an important role in the capitalist drive to produce and accumulate surplus value, right? So the social labors that we need to produce life and maintain life is as important to capital accumulation as the produ production process itself. So that's the sort of insight on which um, uh, social reproduction theory is built. And this tradition picks up on and aims to correct 
uh, the naturalization of the gender division of labor seen in Marx's critique of capitalism and in the socialist tradition more broadly. Um, the appropriation of our surplus labor by capitalists is the source of the dominance of the bosses. And without our labor power, then the system would collapse. But Marx is frustratingly silent on the rest of the story. So if labor produces, labor power produces value, how is labor power itself produced, right? So that's the uh, silent part in Marx that social reproduction theory um, picks up on and develops. So um, labor in this view is, is in the view of social reproduction feminism, first and foremost, the practical human activity required to produce life in general and to produce workers for capital in particular. So it has that twin impulse, right? It sustains life. And yet this life is sustained within the paradigm of capital's imperatives. So on the one hand, capital does not intervene directly in social reproduction processes. However, social reproduction processes cannot go beyond a certain horizon because we still operate within the ambit of capitalist imperatives. So for instance, um, I the fact or the ways in which I love my daughter or care for my daughter uh, is there is no intervention from capital in those ways. However, I would be a poor mother if I didn't also socialize my daughter in particular ways um, to, to fit into society, to be able to hold down a job, you know. Including um, schooling and precisely. life work. Right. So, um, you know, I, as an anti-capitalist feminist, hate to wake her up in the morning at uh, 630 to say it's time for school because it's a meaningless, it's, it's a meaningless exercise, you know, that she has to go to school at a certain time. I mean, those kind of <laughs> disciplines of time are there not for schools to impart education, but for schools to train the next generation of workers. That's why, you know, the clock time is so important. So for me, it's it's awful to, to wake up a, a teen girl, uh, you know, at an ungodly hour and say, let's go to school. But I would be failing her yeah. Uh, if I didn't do that. So so the, the family or social reproduction labor performs those twin functions. On the one hand, there is no direct intervention from capital. On the other, uh, we do operate within the paradigm that capital sets for us. And it's the same, I want to say social reproduction labor does not just take place in the home. Uh, schools and hospitals are important sites of social reproduction labor, um, training the next generation of workers and training their labor power to be attractive to capital, right? Which is why teachers will uh, tell you, you can't come in late because ultimately the, the thinking behind that is if we don't train you, then you'll be fired from whatever job you uh, ultimately mm -hmm. hold, right? So. Uh, do not disrupt people when they're talking. You know, all the little disciplines that school teach you are ultimately also training your labor power to be uh, available in the market uh, when when you grow up. So, so again, uh, schools can teach you dissent and it still remains, universities and schools still remain the most important critical sites for training young minds in anti-capitalist ideas, which is why the right likes to attack us, mm -hmm. but it, they are also sites where labor power is trained to become the kind of labor power that capital needs. Correct. One of the things at uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University from where I did my master's was this, disparity between so to start with it was a humanities uh, sort of centered university but increasingly the rhetoric is that these are 
unproductive work that they do and they're bringing in more and more engineering biotechnology and management and so on so that, that is built on the idea of the job market so primarily um, the right wing and the capitalist class sees the function of the university as preparing us for the job market and any form of uh, you know deviation from that has uh, shouldn't be tolerated. Um, there is another component to that I may add. It is absolutely the same here in, in the US that you know um, uh, STEM disciplines are basically crowned as the only way to understand human development, whereas uh, you know poetry, God forbid, is is considered a useless, unproductive um, discipline. Uh, or, or field of knowledge. Um, so having said that, I would also like us to think about how um, the, the humanities and the arts are not completely ruled out. You know, the best humanities and arts are still being um, practiced and, and thought through and discussed, but only in very, very elite universities. In other words, the right to beauty, the right to wonder is not being completely demolished, but it is becoming more and more the preserve of the ruling class, right? So Shakespeare cannot be for the community college student. Shakespeare for the community college student, let's offer them more uh, classes on welding, whereas Shakespeare remains, you know, in the classroom of Stephen Greenblatt at Harvard, right? So those who can make it to Stephen's uh, class, and she, he must be a fantastic teacher, uh, this is not about him, but those who can make it to Harvard get the um, wonder and beauty of reading and learning Shakespeare, whereas in my local community college, I see more and more courses on um, how to cut hair, how to weld, you know, how to become a policeman. And, you know, those are the classes that are most suitable for the working, uh, working class. Right. So, I mean, the idea of laser love and, you know, all are not completely demolished, but it's so sort of it's made more available for the one percent and in many ways for the 99 percent to serve that one percent you talk about dual organizing where you say that uh things like um paid nursing and so on has been made available to sections of the elites but that has come at the cost of um not just forcing women both in the global north and significantly in the global south to very low paid wage work in mining, textile and so on, or also in, within the care work, eventually limiting the freedom of working women to look after their own families. So there is this right. dual aspect uh, of how capitalism relates to the social reproductive sphere. Right. So uh, social reproductive work is not free floating uh, in the sense that, as you say, um, you know, the 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 feminist activist um, in the global north can or in India, let's take India, the feminist activist in India can go to her march and go to her demonstration because she has a woman at home okay. who's cooking and cleaning and taking care of her child, right? So, so social reproduction labor is not uh, free floating, but anchored in specific bodies and places, right? And so attending to both of these, this concrete aspects of these specific bodies and these specific places within a capitalist totality allows us to analyze social reproductive labor as always racialized as well as gendered, right? Because there is a determinant logic to why uh, these uh, struggles and this terrain is shaped by sexist, racist, and colonial relations. 
And uh, what I want to say is this is why I think we emphasize several times in the book, and I do always in my other writing, that community-based struggles, therefore, are as crucial as workplace-based struggles. So the struggle for clean water by communities of color in Detroit and struggles for dignity for Dalit activists in India are different in form and historical memory, but have the same anti-systemic content in challenging capital's priorities of profit-making over people-making. Struggles uh, is very central to the manifesto. In fact, you were writing uh, at the time in 2000, starting in 2016, the um, women's strike um, in Poland, I guess, in 2016, Argentina, United States, and then all over. Um, and so, and you mentioned about the context of the Communist Manifesto towards the end of the book, the a specter is haunting Europe, the context of 1848 and how they wrote the manifesto, the Communist Manifesto. So, and you are, so first, uh, one thing is the word strike itself. I mean, I grew up thinking about women's demonstration or something as demonstration and not something strike. And I think this is very important because demonstration is then something, you know, where you go during your leisure time or managing time out of your work or whatever you were supposed to do. But when you bring in the concept of strike, you are saying that this is directly related to work. So uh, tell us a little bit about the concept of women's strike. What does it mean? Is it a labor strike? Is it something beyond that? And what are some of the organizational structures that you see coming up to advance this struggle? Right, so uh, there's been a lot of water under the bridge since we wrote the book and since the sort of uh, wave of women's strikes. And I would say there's been a definite pushback and and uh, sort of clawing back of some of the gains we made um, even four years ago. Um, we can see how Roe v. Wade has been overturned in the United States. Um, as you say, a pro-trans bill has been pushed back in by Rishi Sunak in, in Scotland and, and so on. And there's there's definitely been a pushback from uh, the, the ruling classes in various countries. So the question of strike, um, how is a feminist strike different from an ordinary workplace strike. So the question of feminist strike uh, came up, as you know, from 2016 Poland, in which the whole country came to a standstill when women uh, protested uh, against their very pernicious abortion laws. Um, and there is a precedence to that, which is a strike in Iceland in the 1970s, which was also uh, countrywide, and the country came to a standstill um, for uh, the, the women striking for reproductive rights in Iceland. So uh, those were the sort of things we had in mind. But I think a women's strike is very uh, different from just a workplace strike is because in a women's strike, we are saying that we will do no form of labor, productive or reproductive. So, I mean, you know, we are not going to just stay home uh, and not go to work. Even at home, we will not cook or clean, okay? We will not take care of anyone, um, you know. They... So in order to sort of make apparent that women do not just do productive work, they do the kind of work that makes productive work possible. So if all of that labor stops, then the world comes to a stop. So that's the sort of purpose of a feminist strike to kind of make that legible. So one of our experiences of the strike here in 2017 was 
we had several nurses write to us and say, I'm going to be working at emergency um, room on March 8th. How can I support you? Because I don't want to walk out. Okay. And so we said, that's absolutely understandable. And actually, that's where we talked about the essential care infrastructure, you know, long before COVID, that some people will just have to do certain essential care work within the within uh, the country, the economy. COVID just made it more visible to all of us. Correct, correct. But we said, but you can still stand in solidarity with the strike, A, by wearing red. So many nurses on the day went to the hospital wearing red, which prompted a conversation within that workplace about it. And you can also join a demonstration that we will have in the evening in your city, you know. So some concrete ways in which, yes, of course, you know, if there is a surgery going on, you can't just walk away. However, to keep in mind that those kind of situations are few and far between. And for those situations, we have a plan. We respect the fact that you need to be here and we have a plan so that you can still participate in your own way. So that was something that we, so in that sense, a feminist strike is very different. Also, um, you know, in a workplace strike, usually this comes later. In the best tradition of labor history, you always have within the uh, strike place uh, sort of um, community kitchens developing, childcare uh, areas developing, but they come sort of later on in the strike, you know, when it's well underway. A consciously feminist strike creates those spaces from the get go, right? Okay, we're going to go on strike. Let's have a communal kitchen where our male comrades can do cooking for the day and provide childcare for our children, for those children who can't march or can't, you know, go anywhere. So those are sort of some conscious infrastructural, intentional um, practices that the feminist strike developed. Um, and I think the best example for me was in the sort of rollout of the teacher strike that happened soon after the feminist strikes, right? So with the, in the teacher strikes that happened in the United States, and I went up and down the country talking to teachers, um, you know, again, because the uh, school teaching workforce in America is 80% women, those strikes were very, very clearly another expression of a feminist strike. Because again, those teachers, because they closed down the schools, they made sure that the children who got free school meals during an active school day still got to eat. So they teamed up with churches to make sure that food was provided for students during the strike time. OK, so they they uh, facilitated that. They made sure that there was um, that they ran uh, crashes in the churches so that, that, you know, parent working class parents could still go to job, even though the teachers were uh, on, on strike. So all of those sort of carefully thought out intentional components to a feminist strike was demonstrated when the workforce was majority women and they went on strike even in the productive sphere how much does it disturb the the household i mean um when one of the things that comes to my mind listening to you is uh Bouver second sex and she wrote at somewhere towards the beginning that women I mean, the difficulty of organizing women because they are dispersed within family. And, you know, unlike she draws uh, a distinction from labor strikes where there is a capitalist class against whom they can strike or, you know, even the struggles of African-American. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, how is there a limit to 
women's ability of giving up, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, there, I mean, it should be both men and women's responsibility, the care work, but that it, it, it has been primarily imposed on women. So to what extent do these women can sort of um, utilize these uh, community arrangements that are often very temporary to sort of come up with something very permanent that can be a source of liberation from their daily, um, you know, um, um, attachment uh, to the to the household. They can't. Um, I'm sorry, this is a very blunt answer, but the reason they can't is not because they don't want it, but because capitalism depends on the heteronormative family form, right? So the heteronormative family form is through trial and error, capitalism has come to this family form as the most convenient way to reproduce the next generation of labor, right? So to, um, to abolish that family form does not mean simply to abolish the heteronormativity of it, which can be abolished, but what needs to be abolished is the family form itself, which is going to take a lot of struggle, anti-capitalist struggle. So I'll give you an example. So um, communal kitchens you talked about, right? So communal kitchens actually exist, uh, but they are they only exist for the rich and they're called restaurants. Okay, so these things, ex um, so somebody cooks for you very good and healthy food for money, uh, and, and that just is there uh, if, if you want to be free of your domestic labor. And if you have enough money, then you never have to cook a single day in your life, right? So, but if we want to universalize that, that means that domestic labor, and this is what you know, early Bolsheviks uh, talked about, like Kolontai, that actually the kitchen has to be abolished. Um, and uh, the, the entire work of domestic labor be taken out of the household and put in the public sphere. So we're talking about public kitchens, public laundries, right. uh, public crashes, okay? So, and that means, think about the kind of infrastructural um, investment that is required to do that sort of work uh, and how unwilling uh, the ruling class will be to do that kind of work, right? So they're all happy to say, oh, look, we have a gay couple or a trans couple, but they're not happy to say, we're going to abolish the family form. When I say abolish the family, I don't mean, you know, I should clarify that, or when I say take the kitchen out, it doesn't mean that you don't get to cook or you don't get to love your kid. It means More that, that cooking and loving your kid should be a choice, choice, right? Rather than a necessity. So think about how much you actually enjoy cooking if you do it when you don't, you're not like tired after a whole day's work and you're doing it for pleasure, feeding your friends or your loved ones, you know, then it becomes a joy, it becomes a skill. But when you have to do it, when there's very little money to do the shopping, when there is, you know, your gas bill is unpaid, then cooking itself becomes an oppressive grind that you just have to go through. So it's that so in other words, the infrastructure of the family has to be abolished and not simply the outward trappings of it, which is, you know, uh, who is doing the care work? Is it a man, a woman or a non-binary person? And it is that kind of infrastructural abolition of the family that capitalism is most resistant to. 
Right. You mentioned about the Soviet experiments. Uh, in fact, uh, I remember reading even, you know, during the First World War or slightly prior to that, some of these experiments like houses without uh, cartons, houses without kitchens, and these are tried even in the United States. Um, and I mean, you rightly mentioned very interesting uh, restaurants as community kitchen for those who have money. I just wanted to say that we also have like um, in Tamil Nadu in India, for instance, the Amma canteen uh, was opened up. I mean, for it's not like it's literally free for even working class where you can get, uh, you know, food for one rupee or two rupees. So it's not that these institutions don't exist or we are talking about utopia, but uh, they have to be much more large scale. They have to be much more sort of... Uh, um, expanded, um, I guess, and th that's the hope, I guess, that we, we are not talking about utopia in that sense. And that's where I think it needs the struggle for feminism, the struggle for gender equality, the struggle for trans rights has to necessarily be an anti-capitalist struggle. Right. It cannot just be equality within the system of capitalism. It has to go beyond uh, and, and demand the, the right to reproduce our life uh, for the sake of uh, our lives, not for the sake of profit. Correct. Um, I had a couple more questions, but are we uh, out of time? Like, let me check. This is... Uh... I probably have to go uh, okay. to Kishman. All it's right, too... then. Um... Do you have enough? Sorry? Do you have enough? No, like I I just wanted to ask uh, one. But do you I... have enough material to? Absolutely, absolutely. Oh, I mean, okay, good. I just wanted to ask like, if you can like take two minutes out. Like, I don't know if it, that would be possible. I just... Sure, yeah. Yeah, Tell I just me. wanted to ask about, uh, so the central point of the manifesto is it's it's a capital-centric uh, sort of critique, uh, or it's, it's a capital-centric um, analysis of society, of the social order. And so my final question to you is, are there spheres of gender uh, struggles, women's struggles, and so on, uh, which may not necessarily be tied to capital. I mean, I think of something like women's struggle against um, within the household, even for elite women's uh, stigmatization and so on. And this is something that comes to my mind coming from India, because not all, I mean, I'm wondering if all forms of struggle for women are so centrally tied to capitalism. Right. So I think- It's like rape, it, for instance. Physical for assault. Rape of women, physical assault. Uh, uh, sexual violence, Sorry. yeah. Right, so I think these uh, sexual violence in particular is generated by capitalist social relations. So I think a struggle against sexual violence, a struggle against, um, you know, uh, forms of law that protect uh, sexual predators, right? Um, that, that stigmatize the survivor. All of these are part of the capitalist totality. So I would actually call these struggles anti-capitalist struggles. However, um, the point is not that every struggle is anti-systemic to begin with. So mm. people do not go into the struggle saying we want a change of the system. But I think that's where the role of revolutionary feminists is quite important. So if we think about, um, you know, my favorite example is um, the uh, uh, the civil rights movement, right? So when we, at the beginnings of the civil rights movement, we see the Montgomery uh, bus boycott, right? The Montgomery bus boycott has one objective, which is to integrate the buses in the town of Montgomery, Alabama, right? Just the one objective. And yet 
the activists who go into the organizing of the boycott actually through the boycott constantly uh, enhance the horizon of possibility of that one movement, right? They say Montgomery today, other towns tomorrow, okay? And from that, we have the slow build up with many backtracking because the KKK, you know, uh, was, was very active. There was lots of violence. But from the Montgomery bus boycott to the march in Washington are several years, okay? So there are several years in between. But what we see is the demand from integration of buses in one small town blossom into the demand for civil rights and dignity for all African-Americans in America, right? So, and this connection is nurtured by conscious, dedicated activists, okay? And that's where I think we as revolutionary feminists have a role to play in every movement um, for gender rights or equality, right? The movement may start off as simply a protest against a particular act of violence, but it is our responsibility to constantly enhance the 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 horizon of that struggle till we reach its um, you know anti capitalist limits. Right, women struggle for bread and weights turned into a revolution in nineteen seventeen March. Precisely, yes, yeah. but yeah. we struggle for bread and roses, comrade. Correct. Professor Bhattacharya, thank you so much for your time. We appreciate your time. Thank you, Jyotishman. It was lovely to talk to you. Take yes. care. Solidarity. Bye. Bye.